for this episode is one of the top security experts in the 254. When we felt that Somalia had become a threat to the country, what did we do? Engineer Sami Onyanko is one of the people that I know who are very passionate about the security of this country. You can pick anyone as a social experiment yes. and make a master shoot out of them 100%. Hey, Ivo, a prolific shooting coach who holds the esteemed position of division champion wa enhanced service pistol, stock service pistol and carry optics in the whole of Africa. Africa Mzima, hapa. Bad news. Engineer Sami Onyango is also the East and Central Africa Safety Officer Instructor. He's also the international point of contact for the IDPA, that is the International Defensive Pistol Association. Has your gun ever saved you? Um, I know what you're asking me, and I will, I will, I will, I will, I will try as much as possible to answer you. Napado Shijawambia, Engineer Sami Onyango is the Advanced Weapons Instructor of the Creme de la Creme of elite and special police units in Kenya. Wale makarawata onekanangi sura. As in you're a bad man when you dedicate life here to make sure this country is safe without caring whether they get the credit or not. They've been trained well to know how to slither in, get in, and remove the bad guys and leave the good guys alive. Serving your country at that level, then you're a hero, is the training measured in the sense that would you show up to work Alafu, let's say you are training a unit from AP. Now we could just send a basi at GSU. <laughs> is, that, is that possible? We went visiting uh, engineer Sami Onyango uh, akiwa kwa range nikiwa full van dem mode nikiwa complete mpaka na look ya toothpick kwa mdomo to complete the bad guy look. Hiyo toothpick ilikuwa nafanya nisikie nikiwa rambo ni aje. And this was my first time operating. I can say operating a firearm. You gonna bullet ndani? Eh. Hebu angalia sasa target. I'll have to show you how that went down before the end of this video. I'm Dr. Kingori and here's a reason to stay subscribed to our channel. Kama huja subscribe, here's the reason to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notifications bell. The last time we had a conversation na wewe, mulikuwa seven master shooters in the country. And I think ulikuwa explain levels from novice or kulikuwa na unclassified. Uh, at least you can promote, you can make a novice. <laughs> Julian Galia Mukono Yangu, because I'm an maker. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when you go all uh, above, kwa hizo level zote, above maxman, I believe, ndiyo kuna master shooter. Yes. And at that point, uh, there was only seven of you in the country. Has that list been updated? Um, yes. Um, Doctor, in fact, it's good you're remembering that conversation. I do. <laughs> <laughs> because by now I thought maybe you'd have improved from a uh, novice to, uh. to, to, to a maximum or something. Nah, eh. But I can see you still see your hands are trembling. Mm -hmm. um, yes, of course. Um, in Kenya, we do have something known as a continuous assessment, which we do for our, uh, all our sports shooters. Okay. And they do this in various capacities. Those ones were in the discipline of IDPA. And those ones when the discipline you know, of IPSC, and that creates a very high level of proficiency. And I think the one we we're discussing with you were more on the IDPA side, that is okay. International Defensive Pistol Association side, yes. which is a discipline that um, really practices more on the defensive side, which yes. is tactical, more of it. And by then, yes, we were seven master shooters, and now we've uh, increased the numbers. Uh, I believe we're 11 master shooters in the in the country today in a period of three years you've yeah. just added like uh four more people yes to be a master shooter really takes a lot of dedication it really have to put in a lot of time and you know a good percentage of us who do this is not our daily bread it's not something you do as a profession and it's not something that you do like you'd be able to be paid by a certain agency a certain yeah. company yeah. or sponsored to do it so it is self-sponsored and it's very expensive because the ammunition that you use for you to be able to train to that level also yes. requires you to be able to deny yourself other things for you to be able to take that as your key spot. So four have increased in the number of IDPA. Yes. But if you come to the IPSC shooters, you'll find that people who are shooting at the level of, of, of uh, sharp shooter or who are shooting at the level of expert 
are currently shooting at a very, very high level, which if they classify under the IDPA uh, rules, they will definitely make it to master. So by today, I think we should be talking about 17 to 18 masters in Kenya. Should have doubled the number since then. So then what does it, um, so can someone be a sharpshooter under the IDPA, but they are not a master shooter? No, in the IDPA is where you get classified. You start from a novice, you become a marksman, you become a sharpshooter, then you become an expert. Then after you become an expert, you become a master. So a sharpshooter is not a higher classified person than an expert or than a master. Oh. Yes. And you say there's a continuous assessment. Yes. So it means where you kill a kid unakuwa mimi. Um, it is possible for me to deteriorate. Ndiyo naweza nikarudi chini nikakuwa mtu ambaye um ule proficiency level yangu inaweza kateremka. Yes, yes, yes. Um but kwa ile classification level once you're yes. a master yes. unabakia kwa ile classification ya master. Ni ile tu ukienda pale kwenye michezo and you go for your competitions you'll find that you will be not performing in yeah. the master level okay. and you'll find that when the results come out of the competition yes. you will be more or less even below the sharp shooters. So it is not something that once you attain it, yes. like, a, like a doctor's um, certification. A doctor is a doctor today, but you find that if they don't practice and yes. go back for, re, for up, upgrading their skills to modern te- techniques of today, yes. they would remain a doctor, but they'll end up not being able to do the work they're supposed to be working. So it is the same thing as shooting. It's a very perishable skill, which really requires you to keep on training. So if you yes what you're saying, but you'll not be downgraded that you'll be you'll not be called a master you'll still be yes. called a master but you'll be a master below maxman uh-huh. in performance that is or be called a master out of fear yeah. now <laughs> let me ask a comparative question yes. um, i refer to movies a lot when mm-hmm. you look at the history mm-hmm. yeah some come americans while they were revolver mm-hmm. like um, there were there was a, a style of settling disputes Mm-hmm. where you go out with someone mm-hmm. and then mtu anasimama pale pande hii eh, and the, the opponent on this other side wa kwanza kupiga mwingine risasi mm-hmm. eh, has won yes uh, it's called a duel Ch- challenging a someone duel, to a yes. duel right mm-hmm. is that comparative to what you call a master shooter how fast you are uh, skill ama technique skill and technique combined for you to be a master shooter um Visafi what you would call how fast you can draw and get your shot to the target is out of maybe something known as repeatable performance if you can be able to repeat something very very much often it becomes a muscle memory and in that way if i'm only training on how to draw my firearm and take a shot at one yes, target yes, and yes. if i train that consistently as you've seen in those western movies they grew up with their revolvers yes. and maybe that was the best thing they used to do yes. and the best example they used to have the mkebes the mm. and they used to draw and shoot mm. draw mm. and shoot mm. draw and shoot and imagine you doing that since the time you get from 5 years to the time you're getting to have a duel with someone it means you've had a dispute yes, and yes. that dispute could have arisen from maybe a woman mm. could have arisen from maybe a fight or yes. from something different yes and now that means for several years you've mastered that skill Okay. Now when you do that of course you're going to outshoot somebody who has mastered the field of a master like in today's time where he's mastering to combine the seven fundamentals of shooting and perfecting them for him to be able to display them not in a stationary position but in different scenarios something we call stages or something we call um courses of fire which would be different scenarios a scenario like you in your house like the way I'm sitting with you and then we are attacked So we simulate that you've been attacked and the robbers have come there are seven of them. Yes. How fast will I neutralize these robbers by making sure I shoot them without harming an innocent person, meaning I'm sure of my target when I'm hitting a notice beyond it. I am equally also supposed to look at the distance that I'm shooting them from. If it is a steel target or if it's a target mm-hmm. that I know if I shoot at it might ricochet and the bullet come back and hurt me or somebody around me. I'm supposed to be cautious that that is more less than 10 yards. So what do I do? I stand behind the 10 yard distance and I engage my target. I must also be able to look at something known as the trajectory of the bullet. How will the bullet fly? Will it ricochet and come back to me or do I take an angle of 45 while I'm shooting this person? Meaning, I have to change my the dynamics of my shooting and I might be able now to engage this person from a standing position, from a kneeling position or from a prone position. 
So I must combine all these things and take that same shot that guy was taking in that two seconds and hit my target. But me, as a master shooter, these are all factors that I combine. Then I combine the seven fundamentals of shooting, which is the stance, the grip, the sight alignment, the sight picture, trigger manipulation, breath control, and then repeating the same thing again and again. I must combine all those things and execute that shot at the fastest time possible and get my shot at the zero or at the alpha. They'll be scored at 100%. That is different from somebody who would stand here today and quickly draw and just hit one target. So, so the, the difference, difference between someone, the difference between kuangukia uh, versus mastery is how many times you can repeat. Yes. And the repetition is actually now a muscle memory. The it distance, is not something you do consciously. It is known as an, an unconscious competence. You're competently doing something unconsciously. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so distance uh, between where the bullet is being sent from and its final destination is not about how fast or slow someone dies. It's <laughs> mathematics. It's mathematics. It's physics about angles and stuff. So, hey. Dying is a little bit well, different there because you see the dying. You're talking about bleeding. You're talking about the impact. You're talking about ballistics. We talk about the dying. Internal ballistics of the firearm is what happens between the barrel inside the bullet before it comes out. External ballistics, so the bullet is traveling to its path toward its target. Then again, internal ballistics means when the bullet hits you and the kind of damage it does to your organs mm -hmm. before it either settles inside okay. or exits on the other side of And its also, target. mastery in this case does not mean you are good across uh, all range of firearms because I believe there's a difference between a sniper and someone who's good at uh, small arms. Very true. You are very right. Um, when we talk about master shooters in IDPA, it also gives you divisions. And in those divisions, there are also classifications. And in these divisions, you would be a master shooter in stock service pistol. You'd be a master shooter in enhanced service pistol. And these pistols are all different kinds of pistols. There are some pistols which are like Ferrari cars. They've been boosted, they've put a trigger well, they've done some things on it, so it's a smoother trigger. Subaru shoot, pistol. And, yeah, so a, a Subaru pistol, as you could put it, yes. Uh -huh. And then now this one is enhanced service pistol. But a stock service pistol is just how it comes from the factory. And in other disciplines, they call it production. Others, they call it standard. Means that some things allowed in certain pistols are put to you on a certain level. Because yours, your pistol could be giving an advantage, and somebody else who's shooting at just a standard pistol must not be classified as you. So you're very right. But you find that a sniper, now when you talk about a sniper, I don't know in what context you're talking about a sniper, because people have talked about snipers, saying that sniper is a sharpshooter, that sniper is a marksman, that sniper is a novice, that sniper is, they combine and confuse some of these two aspects. A sniper is somebody who's trained to deal with rifles. And these rifles are supposed to be able to engage targets at controlled distances. And he has control of those distances with his understanding of the natural calamities, not natural calamities, natural um, habitations of the world. Means gravity, wind direction. There are many things that are factored in when it comes to a sniper. But when somebody is shooting a pistol, it is more or less on his trigger pull, or his sniping also has a trigger pull effect, but you'd find a pistol is more on your two hands connection, the kind of stance you have, equally to a sniper, but a pistol is a, is a more simpler activity you're talking about than a sniper who would sit here and take a shot at 600 or 800 meters or clock one kilometer and has his shot on the target without harming an innocent person five or three or four or six millimeters away from where he's supposed to take his target. His shot is supposed to be precise mm -hmm. and to the point. So you're saying yes. there is someone who is a sniper, is trained, but ukimpata, kama hana yo bunduki yake kubwa, he has a small gun, he will look for stones. Not really for stones, because he has to be all around. So let me tell you, you that snipers are also very good marksmen. They're also mm -hmm. very well trained on the pistols, because the sniping could be their primary weapon, okay. the pistol could be their secondary weapon. So for you to be a good sniper, you must have gone through some thorough training, you must have gone through some specialized training, and they don't ignore the fact that when you're out there doing your sniping work, you must also be able to defend yourself personally.
So okay. they are all round trains. No one has ever claimed credit uh, for the, the killing of one of uh, the most radical um, um, religious leaders in the country at some point. But Kenyans always talk in low tones about how professional that hit was done. Uh, in this sense, a vehicle was moving. The person was in the vehicle with his family. He was nailed himself, yeah, yeah, as the target. I'm sure with your expertise in uh, security, you may have heard of the story. Yeah, yeah, pekeake ndi alipatikana, na everybody else was safe. People always talk about the level of skill in that, uh, in achieving such a shot. Where do you place that? Uyo ni pro professional uh, snipering, uh, uyo ni long range positioning, because I'm very interested in something you said about controlled environment. Mm -hmm. uh, like say for example, oh, the wind is blowing, so hey, when someone looks at you, eh, <laughs> a lot of work is taken into understanding and learning and becoming a professional in the skills that I'm talking about. Uh -huh. A lot of time is taken into it. A lot of dedication is put into um, understanding that the kind of skill that I'm trying to describe to you today yes. is controlled within certain disciplines. Mm -hmm. And that is why it is not something given to the public, it's not something given to just any other person. Yes, it yes, is yes. something that is given to people who understand what their mandate is. And their mandate is not to go there, out there and go and snipe people, but they would be doing it in the call of duty in matters of self-defense, or, okay. or self-defense in defending a country, mm -hmm. national-wide is what mm -hmm. I would talk about. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about a religious leader who was sniped at a distance and the car was moving, I could have heard of the story. I could have heard maybe of it in low tones, people saying it took very keen, um, good person to do this and that. Of course, if you're going to shoot somebody from a, a moving vehicle and there are four of them and you pick your target, then you knew exactly what you were doing. You were skilled for it because it's not by luck mm -hmm. or coincidence that you did get your, you did get your target. Okay. And the movies at times do give us some peak of what could be happening in the real life. Some peak. Some peak. I would call People it say that, that movies exaggerate. So exaggerate. in fact, some of the things that are done in movies cannot be replicated in real life. Uh, which is which? Um, you're, you're very right. Some of the things that I see in the movies, even me myself, I, I enjoy seeing them because I wish that it would be possible for someone to do some, some things like that, or someone yeah. to train to a level where they can be skillful to get around eight or nine people and take them out and at the same time move at this speed and move at that speed. You see, it is all about entertainment. Not possible. It is, it is very difficult to achieve John Wick, dancing, that, she come to, uh, you hold someone's head, you blast him that, with the other person those, next those, to them. Those, 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 are, those are movies and that's why they're entertaining. Because in real life, that is not entertaining. Ah. That is not entertaining. Okay. Yes. In our previous conversation, you mentioned max, ma marksmanship in something I said. Niki kupata lazima nikuulize tena. You explained marksmanship in the sense, uh, in, a, in a hostage situation, mm -hmm where someone is trained enough that he, when someone is holding a hostage, a marksman is able to shoot a bullet through someone, calculatively, if you are trained enough, through someone to get a suspect. How possible is that? Um, I think what I meant was that when you look at the rules and what we talk about the laws of firearms and how you control your firearm, uh, we talk about the fourth rule, which talks about knowing your target, what is in front of your target, and what is beyond your target. So you'd find that the kind of um, rounds that we, we use in the country, they're called um, uh, the solid rounds, can penetrate through a soft tissue yes. and go and do damage to another being that could be beyond your particular target. Yes. And in this sense, then if you are a hostage and you're being held and somebody's holding, the bad guy is holding you, um, if a shot goes through you, it can also hit the bad guy and take out the bad guy. Yes. These are things that are, are seen in the movies. But for me to make that decision that I'm going to shoot you, for me to get to the guy <laughs> who is on the other side. Yes. You see, it's, 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 it's crazy. That's the only judgment call uh, on yeah, the individual. It's, it's, yeah, it is, it is at that time. What is it that we are looking at? Because 
if the bad guy is on uh, is wearing a vest or he's got a bulletproof vest on him, mm-hmm. then what are we saying? If I shoot you, then I'm 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 first injuring you, yes. and I have to evacuate you. That means if my mission was there to save you, it will be even difficult to get you out of that location. Okay. I have better choices where I can change the trajectory of the bullet. If I go kneeling, my bullet, my position would go different. If I sidestep to the side, it will be different. But if that mm. call at that moment requires for a shot like that, mm. and if it is me who's gone to that particular area, if I'm found as a civilian and I'm in my home, yes. and I think this is the right thing to do yes. for me to save the life of the person who is, who is in front, then it's a judgment call. That's a very nice explanation because I, I almost went into, you said something, okay, explain Vizuri, I almost felt like, um, like you mentioned a call to hostages to practice fitness so that it's easier to save them. <laughs> now, you also mentioned bulletproof, bu- bulletproof vests. Yes. And again, in our previous conversation, I wish I followed this up, you, you talked about you need a permit yes. to own a bulletproof vest or clothing. Mm-hmm. Why? Number one, security starts with you. What's the logic? Mm -hmm. The government, why does the government want me to be killable? If I've taken my initiative to go get a bullet, why do I need a a permit to to be safe? (laughs) Now, these are controlled substances. The reason why they're controlled substances is that why would you, as a normal civilian who's going around his normal duties, want to have a bulletproof vest on you? I probably want to go visit someone in Kariobangi once in a while. Who said Kariobangi these days, if you go, you'll only be shot? Because Butita says bullets there are normal. So, <laughs> precautions. Okay, the um, control substances always have to be controlled. And during that control system, then you see you have to be known who is this who's getting this bulletproof jacket. You have because to. You have to. Because also the bad guys have realized that when they're going to do their robberies, they will encounter the police. So what do they want to do? If it is free for all, then they will just simply be walking into the supermarket, Mm -hmm. buying these bulletproof jackets and bulletproof clothings, and then they go and do all these damages. And they will stand there, knowing that when a gunfight comes out, he's going to be okay to move on with it. But you see, we have to deter and make sure that this cannot happen. And when I say we, I mean Kenyans. We must accept that these laws are set to protect us as, as a people. And the reason why they say you must come for a permit is they're asking you to notify them so that they know who are these who are carrying bulletproof jackets. Are they being used for good or are they being used for bad? So it is even easier to say, when you're going to buy that particular bulletproof, send us some information. Tell us you want to buy a bulletproof so that we know Dr. Kingori wants to buy a bulletproof. Why is he buying a bulletproof? Because he wants to go to Kariobangi. Why don't you give him escort to go to Kariobangi than him buying a bulletproof? So, which means there's a possibility that if I can afford it uh, and I'm interested in buying a bulletproof vest, I can apply for a permit and it would be denied. Um, it happens this way. For you to apply for a permit and for it to be denied, of course, you did, you not, give, you did not give sufficient reasons. Because why would a whole board sit down <laughs> and deny you a permit and you've simply applied for it? And you're a Kenyan, you have the right. And of course, that bulletproof permit also must be put somewhere. Okay, let me ask you. Look at the people in the media, people in your field. They wear bulletproof jackets. They don't wear the bulletproof jackets because they want to go to just carry your bangi because we know that the areas that they're working in as media people, there could be situations where there could be other projectors. It's not only a bullet. You could find that they can also protect you from stab wounds. They could also be protecting you from certain areas that things could have exploded, there's projectiles all over, yeah. and that could come in handy. That is why there's safety gear. It is actually part of your safety gear. It's part of your PPEs. It is your head gear you're going to have, which is a, a helmet. Okay. It's not because you're going to go there and somebody shoots you at the head. No, yeah. it is to protect your head because the kind of job you're doing at that moment is a dangerous job. I've had the opportunity to train the nation team when they came and we discussed about situational awareness. Yeah. And they came and we also discussed many other things on really in relationship to security wear, which was now your bulletproof jackets, your helmets, how to don them, how to remove them at, um, at, at times when you, you, you have to move to position one, position two, during emergency, you've been hurt already. How do you remove that bulletproof jacket before you treat the person or before you do a quick response to him? Yes. As a layman, my simple rule of wearing a bulletproof vest is no meat. Like, it should show no meat. 
it means it's safe. Mm-hmm. What do you mean there are rules about how to wear a bulletproof vest? Yeah, it's not it's not just worn like a jacket like that. You see, the bulletproof comes. Is it a vest carrier? Is it a bulletproof jacket that requires another level of protection on top of it? And then how you strap it on you must be fitting well enough. He's not going to wear it like the way you're wearing a jacket that is going to be swinging. Mm-hmm. Remember, it's very heavy. Some of them weigh up to eight kilos. Some of them weigh up to 12 kilos. So these are things you're going to be carrying. You can't be wearing it on a normal day when you're going for a date. There are some of them which are lightly made for that protection, like the ones you see being worn by VVIPs. Those ones are actually well material made and they are, they are modern and they're quite light to be worn. But all these things require you to have a permit. And that permit is equally not very difficult to be issued as people presume. All you need to do is make sure that you put in your reasons. Because the people who look at this and decide mm. Mm. that you're going to get this are very sober, normal Kenyans. Okay. Yes. It's interesting. That's a low blow, actually, when you say you can't wear a bulletproof uh, vest to a date. That means you can't wear a bulletproof vest when you're going to shoot your shot. <laughs> so um, you say that a lot of, there's intensive training that goes into someone being a master, a marksman. And you know, for snipers, actually, I think it's ranked from our, our world of laymen uh, as one of the top uh, most intensive trainings. Like I think snipers are ranked as, oh, they go through the worst. And for the most part, I know, uh, apart from a few mathematics, you do a pen and a paper and lying down. Where is the intense coming? Like sleeping for long? <laughs> no, you see the intensiveness of the training of a marksman. A marksman, if you've watched the Dubai SWAT challenge, which is currently going on in Dubai right now, it's mm-hmm. live on, 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 on YouTube. And you yes. can see every event which the special teams are, uh, are displaying there yeah. has a sniper. And the sniper is the one who goes and takes the sniper shot. Once he takes the sniper shot, it's a warning shot. He tells the team if they are clear and they bridge. They move in and they're able to go and take their positions and do whatever it is they need to do. Then from there, they exit their position. Mm -hmm. And the the sniper is also the first person to move to the other end. And the sniper always tries to attain a a high high level, a high position Mm -hmm. so that he can scout. So what does he do? He observes. The sniper observes. He sits in a position, he observes, sees the area is clear. If there is imminent threat where the team is heading to, he neutralizes it for them to be able to move. Remember, this is a war now. I'm talking about a war now, yes. where, where people have gone to war. This is not a situation where we've got innocent civilians who are sitting somewhere, and a sniper is sitting somewhere, is thinking that guy looks like he looks like a threat. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. we're talking about a war scenario, which has already been declared, a terrorist scenario, uh, deceit cases, our uh, wastegate cases where you can see that there's somebody who's already gone inside and they've already taken out a life and two. So these people have to respond. And some of the decisions they make there now are the decisions that choose decide for us as Kenyans. Where are we? They put us in the right position. We cannot so, just keep oh, on losing lives. So intensity is in being all-rounded. Yes. That yes. you're able to operate under different circumstances and execute and oh. deliver. Yes. So that he's a team player and he's dependent on in every team, even soccer, the goalkeeper is a team player. And if the goalkeeper is not good enough, then you start having on scene, or you start having problems with the with the goalkeeper. Yeah. You find that he's being scored left and right and it becomes an issue. Okay. So you you really have to make sure that uh, all the team all round is 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 built to the right position. Because you see a team is as strong as its weakest link. link. So you can't allow one person to be low down there because he'll bring the whole of the team low. So sniping, yes, it's a skill which has to be trained. It is trained well. And Kenya is doing very good in that line. Our officers are up to the task. That much I can assure you. Uh, you train people on very many levels. One, safety instructor. You train the, mm. the trainers for them. You train... Um, you train on different levels as yes. far as security is concerned. Mm-hmm. What do you say for those like us who watch movies and want to be James Bond? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I understand, and I'll tell you about it, that Kenya Ikonawa Siwa deadly, like the James Bond state as we see in movies, like uh, to ensure that the country is safe, right? What do you say to the person who wants to train to that level? What, what is the requirement? It is uh, it's a skillful duty. And it is a position that somebody really stands and feels proud to be in. If you're serving your country at that level, then you're a hero 
in this country. Um, I don't want to say unsung heroes because it's a different phrase. I don't want to say unmentioned heroes, but these are not just our day-to-day -day normal citizen, our day-to-day -day normal officer. These are people who have taken their time, they are dedicated to their jobs, and they've been trained to a very high skill level. And they are proud to stand there strong. And my, my, I think my message to everybody else out there would be that this is something that we should be seeking for. Our young men who are out there should not just look at the jobs in this country and say that, no, when there's a police recruitment, when there's a, a military recruitment, these are the highest achievements they should be looking at. They should look at it and say, I want to become an officer there because I want to become a special team officer. I want to get to the top and serve my country at the best, at the cream de la cream, but at the have... position where if you're called upon, you know that you're not going there to chance. You know that you're skillful enough to penetrate through that door and come out from the other door with full results and making sure that your country is safe. So me as an instructor, I'll tell you that given opportunities where we are able to share some of the skills that we do have, we are proud when you see your student outbeat you. You're really very happy when you see your student performing to levels where they're recognized Africa-wise, they're recognized internationally. We locally here hold African titles. We hold international titles. Apart from just being, um, being a, a, a master shooter myself, I am a four-time African champion in three, in four different divisions, which have won by me moving from one division to the other division to the other division and to the other division. I and this has, this, this has made me ask myself, if I am able to achieve this, then how good are our officers able to achieve? And I've seen them achieve, and they are doing extremely well. What informs a good student? Um, Am I anyone, what as long informs, as they put their mind to it? What informs a good student? First is the interest. You must really be interested in what you're learning. You must want to be able to push the limits. You cannot just say that you're going to go and learn something because you've been pushed to do it. And you must find interest in it. And if you love what you're doing, then trust me, the rest of the journey is usually, it could be uphill, it could be painful, but it is called sweet pain. There's a reason. There's a reason you must have interest. Yes. This reason that you must have interest, this is the reason you need to tell someone what a student needs to be. What's the fitness level of the basic no, person is, you can you take You see, fitness training. is achieved over time. Fitness is not something you wake up today and you have. Fitness is achieved over time. You could have been the laziest person, but you've come here and you've seen, oh, this is interesting for me. And the, the, the teaching methods that we deploy also determines and helps the student to become a better person. It makes them make decisions like, hey, I'm going to keep on training here because I like what I'm doing. There has to be a sense of like. There has to be a sense of interest. And then dedication. When you combine all these things, then the physical part of it takes place, the mental part of it takes place, and then the commitment part of it takes place. Because you don't become a good, um, for the lack of a better word, you don't become a good sportsman or a good officer or a good special team operator by simply relying on your teammates to do the hard work while you come and take the glory. You have to be the one doing the hard work. And that hard work is the dedication. There has to be commitment and there has to be things that are done deliberately. So if you're repeating an exercise, there has to be deliberate, repeatable performance in things that you're doing so that you can be able to come out well. Look at your mental strength now. How do I become one of the best if my mental strength will not allow me to go beyond the normal? I must be able to push to levels. I don't know if King Ori and me and you now are told, stand up and let's go. There's a, a bushfire in front there, and there's another bushfire in front there, and that is where we are heading. But behind us, there is a clear path. We can simply go back home. So we choose, do we go back home or do we find methods and means to penya here? So I would rather stay there for eight hours finding a way to go through that fire than turn around in 15 minutes and go back home and sleep. Because my mind tells me that I should not give up. 
are you saying that you can pick anyone like as a social experiment you would pick someone from the street yes. or someone from their homes yes. and make a master shoot out of them anyone can do it 100% i don't think i have a speck of a doubt in me that everybody can make it everybody has a capacity everybody has the ability everybody has a chance just given that chance given that chance everyone can make it to that level all we need to do is believe in ourselves and to be given that opportunity it has not been easy for kenya to develop itself to where we have reached today look at how we've been able to pick ourselves from agricultural sectors we've had partners who've come in and put in some good support look mm-hmm. at our security sectors mm-hmm. some people ask me um earlier on i think i was even having a conversation with you and you're asking me about israel mm-hmm. and you're saying how come everybody thinks that israel is is a place where if you go to you'll find the best and you'll find the best yes israel has the best they have the best according to the israeli standards if you go to the usa you'll also find the best according to the usa standards alafu engineer sam where does your story start with guns oh firearms yes oh, um, there's a difference between guns and firearms <laughs> i think guns is just a general term that people use uh, when you refer to being an instructor of course we try to refrain ourselves to certain terminologies so that we make the students understand so say firearms exactly. is when i say firearms i mean a universal line of firearms Mm-hmm. and when you mean weapons then you mean all sorts of weapons and you see there are small arms there are yeah. other arms uh, which are different but my life with firearms started oh some time way back when i used to love going hunting and i had very good family friends who could travel with me and uh, my other family members whenever they used to go to some of their ranches We were not born in a background of a background where we were lucky to own ranches but we had friends who had ranches and we used to travel to their ranches and we really go to their ranches they had shotguns and they had rifles in Kenya, in Kenya. I'm talking about some time back some very good years back this is uh, in campus high school just since high school when I was still in high school and we could be able to go out there and uh, do some hunting in uh, Kenya in Kenya so some some good time back and we were able to i was able to master the skill and i loved from that time i just got a passion of firearms and i agree with that passion and i remember my first uh, pistol when i applied for it it took 6 years before you got a license before i got a, i got a response and the response came through one of the box offices which we had dedicated back and i got the letter i think another 6 months once it was received from that box office and when i saw it i didn't understand even what it was but i knew i was been waiting for something about the firearm license patiently 6 years waiting 6 years later is when i received my response for the for the firearm and it was telling me that with that piece of paper i should go and uh, see my ocs and from my ocs i should go and take the document to the firearm licensing board then the water place in a near community there yes and i i was so happy i didn't I, i i didn't know i was so excited i don't think i slept that night because i couldn't wait for the next day to reach so that i would go and when i went there i was told to pay 2000 shillings which i didn't even have so that i'm able to to be given my 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 my, my license mm-hmm. and i hurriedly left that position went to a very good friend of mine who gave borrowed, me the 2000 bob borrowed 2000 i went i paid and i went to see my os yes uh-huh. he asked me about the safe and then look for money again i got That's a safe, safe installed it at the house and he came inspected the safe how old are you then, at this time i was quite young <laughs> seven years after after high school <laughs> yes of course after high school after high school after high school yes going on to this interesting so uh, after you get the license after you get the safe yes. there's money to buy the gun yes if you didn't have 2000 yeah uh, bunduki sita to come it took me about uh, some time about uh it was going around 8 months or something to hustle for the gun when i was not really going up and down but i never used to pass a place known as guns and cameras which was in cause on kenyatta avenue there i belonged to a friend known as mr ludek and i used to always pass by there and he never stopped giving me lessons because whenever i could visit his shop he could allow me to go inside 
And uh, he knew I had a license. And uh, he, sh- he could take my license and tell me, Sami, um, maybe one day when we go to the to Savo, where he takes care of some lions and things like this, we will be able to, to go and shoot together. So he could give me fundamentals of shooting. He taught me how to handle the weapon. He took me through a lot of lessons before I knew. He found uh, one of the 92 FSs, Beretta 92 FS, silver. And he told me that this firearm, the cost of it, I'll give it to you at half price. All you need to do is fight and find the money when you come with it, and I will be able to half to at half the cost position. And what are some of the side effects? You have your gun, Maria Kwanza, mm-hmm. uh, like my, my first car, ex, any excuse to go out, mm-hmm. like just to fill the road. Did you have like uh, the rushes that are walking at night, just wishing you can find something you can intervene in, like opportunities to use it? They say that firearms are men's best toys. And of course, when you have it, you would also start feeling as if you would want to carry it 24-7. Mm-hmm. And I would really thank Ludek for what he did for me, because for all that period when I used to stay with him, I came to understand some of the controls and some of the things that you need to do or do not do with your firearm. But of course, there is no day I think I slept without it next to me, because I would imagine how soon would I react if somebody would come to this house. My mind then was not telling me that for all those years, nobody has ever come to this house. How come now that I have a gun, people would come? But then there was this story that once you own a firearm, then these bad guys would come for it to your house because they think they want to take it from you and it would be an easy catch. So you become extra careful, you become become more alert, and then you keep it more closer and you're more, you're more, you're, 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 you're more, for how do I say it? You're more careful, vigilant. basically. Uh, your vigilance level is high, but you're more careful on how you operate, where you go, and things you do. If you're a nightclub person, then you must cut that into 50% or less. It'll just cut it off totally. So owning a gun can cure alcoholism? <laughs> it, it, it will cure alcoholism. If you're a sharp enough person, then that will cure alcoholism because those two things do not mix. mix. Uh-huh. Yeah, Guns um, and alcohol do not mix. And between us? for the period that you've uh, dealt with firearm safety and security. Yes. Do you, have you had moments that you thank God you own a firearm? Yes, several moments. Today in life, what do I do? I'm a firearms instructor. The owning of the firearm has given me a new life. I would, I, would, I would be pursuing other things in life, but this is what I love, this is my passion. It has given me a chance for me to be able to, to, to put bread and, and, and food on my table using the same line. Yeah. And it has also given me an opportunity to share my knowledge to other, with other people. It has given me a chance to actually prove that even Kenyans, as Kenyans, mm-hmm. we are capable and able to be officers who yeah. can provide services to our own national teams. Even um, our own police teams, we are able to train them and we are able to stand strong and say that, yes, I'm proud to be associated with that team because they are doing well. In terms of when someone asks you, and I think this is a very powerful and uh, thought-provoking thing to say, Ati, when you'd rather have a gun than not have a gun and find yourself in a situation that you need a gun and wish that you had it. Mm-hmm. So those are the kind of situations I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, has your gun ever saved you? Um, I know what you're asking me. <laughs> and I will, I, will, I, will, I will try as much as possible to answer you. Uh-huh. I'll say that every person who owns a firearm should be happy and proud that they never get to use it unless when they're training or for sporting purposes. Because okay. if you're using it for any other scenario, yes. then chances of you taking a life is very, very high. It's not something that you're proud of doing unless your life is an imminent threat. There's imminent threat to your life. Okay. That is when you can get to use your firearm. And equally, if you own this particular firearm yeah. and then you develop yourself to be a safekeeper. Yes. Safekeeper are the people who have these firearms. But then they decide that because I have my firearm, yes. I'll be keeping it in the safe. So why is it in the safe? And you leave this place, you travel long distance, you've gone to a place where you've carried a lot of money, you're going to pay people, You've left this place, you're going to a hostile scenario, a hostile area, you've left the firearm at home, and immediately when you're attacked and something very bad happens to you and you start wishing, why did I not carry my firearm? Mm-hmm. Okay, you don't go for training with this particular firearm. You don't yes. improve your proficiency levels. You just keep it in the safe and you like saying, I have a firearm. 
then when the bad time comes and bad guys have come to your house and you can't even reach your own safe to remove the firearm and be able to protect your family, then you're caught off guard and you don't have now the ability to move to where your, where your firearm is and for you to be able to get it and save your family. Mm -hmm. Then you start wishing, why didn't I do this? Or then you have your firearm, but your proficiency level is at zero. So you remove this firearm and it can't fire. It can't actually deal. And you're in that situation. So what do you do? You're there with it and you're a sitting duck. It will be taken away from you and used on you. Napendasana, story, yeah. Uh, the restrictions. How have the restrictions in gun owning uh, grown? What were the things that prompted uh, change in restrictions? Times, times do change. I remember, as I'm telling you, the time when I did receive my, my permit and my firearm license. Yes. Um, we were not even doing psychiatric evaluation at that time. It was really not a requirement. For as that. long as you can afford it. It was not as long as you can afford it. As long as you made an application, a genuine application, which meets the requirements. Because remember, the, the, the Act, the, 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 the Constitution and the Act, the Firearm Act, is very direct and describes exactly what is required of you for you to apply for a firearm. Yes. So it is something inscribed in the Constitution. It is not just a by the way. Yes. It is not a decision that is made by people out of them feeling that I think today we need to make a change or we need to make this and this. And some of these things mm -hmm. have to go through parliament for mm -hmm. the changes to be made. Yes. And the psychiatric evaluation came in important because people's status of mind change has changed, has evolved a lot. From that time to today, you find that, um, I don't want to say that you'd find the, and I don't want to use these terms because tomorrow I might be told, why am I calling them that? <laughs> yeah, that the cool kids, yes. at SG, these guys who just come across, someone who's just made money today or tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, they were called uh, fast money growers or something like yeah, that. Yeah, new money. And then they've all of a sudden found, you found that the kind of licenses that they were holding for firearms were not legal, were not genuine. They were illegal licenses. Uh -huh. And this was a prompt that made the firearm licensing board put strict measures Stringent to case. make sure that things like this do not happen. And today that story is not here nor there. You cannot hear of those things happening because that board is working overnight to make sure that such things do not, do, mm -hmm. do not happen. And they put in more stronger stringent measures to make sure that if you're applying today, you have to have people who are your referees, you have to have the psychiatric evaluation done on you, you have to go through several kinds of vetting from the OCS to the OSPD, from the OSPD to the county level, from the mm -hmm. county level to the regional level, from the regional level, then it comes again to Family Lessons Board. They still come and vet you, even if there was a recommendation from the regional level, they can still deny mm -hmm. and say, no, we still find that this person is not correct. Mm -hmm. So with all these levels, it brought in some very sober controls. And those restrictions okay. has developed now the licensing industry to a point where even sports shooters have to demonstrate and bring evidence that you're a sports shooter for mm -hmm. you to be issued with a license. Okay. Now, um, Kenya, we are blessed that we have a section of Kenyans who've given themselves to make sure the country is safe. And I say this, let me quote... I visited a friend of mine at DCI, a very special officer, shout out to him, Anajijua, and they showed me a magazine, open to the public, right? And shows that Kenya police, uh, beyond the general duty officers, we have uh, specified units, now it's a bad man, like people who can handle stuff and trained in different capacities, right? And that's how we find, for the most part, the country's safe, no incidences, right? They do the most. Uh, what if the reverse was to happen? Like, we were to be a country where uh, it's open policy for all. What kind of society do you think? Do you think Kenyans as a society can survive, uh, can, can, can thrive as Americans? Like, when gun laws are not that tight, kila mtu atana kibanda yake, and the chunga maembe na bunduki yake. Do you think... Uh, do you think the more controlled the firearms are, the better we are? Or do you think Kenya, w what determines whether a society can have a free market for guns? Uh, that's a very difficult question. Even today in the US, they're suffering from the same. Every day you hear the NRA saying, oh, don't take away our constitutional rights, don't take away our human rights, don't take away our rights to own firearms. Yes. So it is a fight that they're fighting. It's not that it is free for all in the way it's, 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 it's portrayed. Yes. It is, you still have to be done for a background check for you to be licensed down there. Yes, yes, you can acquire it in the shops, but you see, 
the discipline here and the difference between there and here, you'd find that the shop owner who sells you this firearm will not sell it to you because you're his relative. He will not give it to you just because you have money. He will give it to you because you've met that small requirement which yes. has been put. Mm -hmm. Now, will that happen here in Kenya? That would have its own challenges because we know that also we've bred a culture where we don't want to follow what the systems are telling us to do. We know that we've been, a system has been set and you've been told, produce your ID, produce your birth certificate, and produce your, your, your PIN for you to get A, B, C, D done. You still don't want to do that. You want to go to that particular department and find someone you know. So that akusaidie, you don't produce a pin, yes. which is something you can simply just go, even a photocopy of your ID. Mm. You don't want to go and take a photocopy and take it somewhere. You yeah. will still ask people, even in your WhatsApp group forums, does anybody have a connect mm. to the ministry of? Mm. Because you don't want to do things the way the system has been put to do. So until we develop a culture, where we can receive respect laid down rules and the systems that have been put on the ground yeah. to make sure that we are safe and able to, I would say a clean no. But when we develop that culture as a people, then the US has got nothing special of us. We are still human beings who are able to be given firearms and to control the environments that we are in. Okay. But do we follow the simple systems which have been put? For you to buy a firearm in the US, you must produce your driver's license. Yes. And with your driver's license, you take the shop owner less than five minutes for him to say if you have a criminal record, if you don't have a criminal record, and if you're good to buy it. Mm -hmm. What about Kenya? How long will it take to identify that Samuel Nyango does not have a criminal record? I was, do we have able systems where it's going to take a shop owner five minutes to tell my background? No. Until we have developed our systems to a point where I can check Dr. Kingori's background in four minutes or in five minutes, or in an hour's time and get quick response, then we can now st start moving towards development of that nature. Uh, but until then, mm -hmm. where we respect our systems and where we can have systems in place to make sure that we are safe, then we should not introduce things that will make us more unsafe. Okay. Oh, introducing that will make us more unsafe. It will make and us more unsafe, yes. I understand. And uh, when it comes to... Security, you have to commend the structures in place yes. that have always made sure that um, a mistake doesn't repeat. Like, for example, uh, we've had peace for a long time, and for I, I, I'm a, it, it's really comforting that for, let's say, for example, the DCI magazine that I saw, mm -hmm. uh, the capacity of the teams to handle staff, I think um, the peace that people have been enjoying can be credited to that. Uh, in capacity, capacity, mm -hmm. eco, right? Uh, but then, uh, for the mistakes that happened, let's say uh, like the Westgate attack, right? Brings a lot of sad memories. Uh, we had an incident of friendly fire. Uh, I think that led to something called, I don't know, Kama, that's where we had multi-agency uh, support introduced, right? Um, am I correct? About the multi-agency? Yes, multi-agency. Before that, did Kenya have multi-agency support and coordination across board? Um, I don't know if it was not there, but all I can tell you is that what it's doing right now is more visible and more effective. What is multi-agency support for some The multi-agency support is a coordination between all departments that are involved in matters relating to security and health. So you find that if there is an incident like now, oh God forbid, what happened in, uh, in Westgate, yes. you'd find that the response that would come from that would not be every team coming from left, right, and center, not knowing what to do. Then there is a central command, and the central command will handle what is going to be coming from the Kenya police, what is going to be coming from the military if they are needed, what's been coming from the emergency um, medical systems if they're needed, what's going to be coming from the fire people if they're needed. So that multi-agency approach gives it a central command point where now all teams that are going onto the ground are coordinated. Yeah. And now the mission planning becomes much more simpler because at that point now, you're able to determine, these are the schematics that we have, this is the building that has been hit, how much information do we have? We have this much information. How do we use that information for us to be use it to lay, to, to move forward? And this I can take it from the concept of what exactly we do even in scenarios like sports shooting. You must be given a brief, 
And you must be told that this is a brief of what you're going to engage. Yes. And then that particular engage, you must do a walkthrough. Our walkthrough is done physically by going to the building. But the security walkthrough, they go the walkthrough by reciting on who is going to attack from which area, who is going to hit which area, who is specialized to deal with such scenarios, who is specialized to do such scenarios. What kind of threats are we facing? Could be a chemical threat we are facing. Could be a biological threat that we are facing. Could be just uh, um, booby traps which have been set in. So it will not take you five minutes. You've landed in two minutes and then you're rushing inside. No, you have to plan it well and then execute. And from that point, then you're able to come out with positive results. But you can go in like that and you can also have innocent people. So you have to understand that when you're going in, what exactly are you doing? When you talk about um, friendly fire, yes. that much I would tell you that things like that are things that should not be seen within our teams. Because the kind of trainings that are currently going on with the, with the teams that we have in Kenya, through a lot of support that we have seen, visibly coming from um, the partners, as you were asking me earlier on, uh, are the Israelis very good? We have an Israeli embassy here, and you know very well that we are coordinating with the Israelis, which you've seen our presidents and uh, some of the displays which are being done in the media today. You can see the advertisement, not the advertisement, you can see the the documentaries which are on, on, on television showing how the multi-agency support works with our partners to develop yeah, our systems. The decorated, celebrated police officers, there's always like a tagline here, trained in Israel. Yeah, trained in Israel, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. like the anti-terrorism support program that we have from the United States Embassy today is doing a marvelous job with our border patrol teams you find that they are consistently supporting one way or the other, consistently supporting one way or the other. So if you're in the security industry, there's some of these things that we do come across. You find them, they are also working very closely with our, our, our special teams, which are now the, the REC team that mm. you so much, so much know about. Mm -hmm. And if you see the REC team who have participated, like in the last, in 2023, Dubai um, SWAT team challenge, which was a special team challenge, it was all, all over the media. And uh, the SOG team that you saw also participating also the other day and they were all over the media. Um, these teams are also being trained by the support of our partners. And, and what they're giving us is, is treasure to us because it is helping us to be able to develop our capacities to very high levels. But I'm not saying that they are better than us. I'm only saying that when they give us these tools and they, know they give us this kind of support, then we are able to maximize our abilities. Uh, when something uh, like, let's say, for example, an attack like the Westgate happens, a layman like me thinks, like um, when it has, like you have suspected this is an attack, right? Why don't you just call all the military officers to figure your cousin in Pema? Does specialization really help? Yes. Specialization really helps. When you call the military to come and just storm and bomb and enter inside there, how many casualties, how many lives are you going to lose there? Because first and foremost, when a place like Westgate is hit, would you be able to give me an account of how many people were inside? You can't. You can't. So when a special team goes inside, they've been trained well to know how to slither in, get in, and remove the bad guys and leave the good guys alive. So, so they're not going have... in with bombs and what and what and explode the whole place. Then why would the terrorists come? You're doing for them their job. So you, you could have a situation where someone from one of the teams is there, but they can't intervene because, ah, this is a kidnapping guy. Mazi, I've been trained for border patrol. Are you saying that's the case? No, 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 definitely. You see, when you're trained for border patrol, it's not that you're trained, you're not trained for... You're not trained Hostage with the skills. Situation. Yeah, you're not trained with all those skills. Uh, the skills are all rounder. And um, the reason why I'm saying somebody could be in border patrol, then you see there is the urban warfare and there's conventional warfare, which you must really understand that the person who could be within the border areas, he is specialized in controlling the movement of people from one side to the other side. He'll be operating not in an urban kind of a setup. But the people who are trained in the urban kind of setup like to now curb things like the Ducit and the, and okay. the, and the, not only Ducit, the Ducit and the Westgate, and they don't, they're not trained to respond once it has happened. Okay. Currently, the, 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 I believe there have been threats, and you've been hearing ah, yes, that yes, there have been threats left, right, and center. And these but teams have been responding really well, and they're doing a great job. And I, Kenyans should know 
that these are our brothers, our cousins and our sisters who are out okay. there and they're doing some marvelous work in support of this country. So as a trainer, yes, you train different units. Mm -hmm. uh, is the training measured in the sense that would you show up to work, alafu, let's say you are training a unit from AP, now we could just have a GSU. Is that is that possible? <laughs> is that is that possible? <laughs> Can you confuse the trainings? Is it measured for each, each of them? Um, you, you see, training is all about the levels of, of, of the students that you're training. If you're, if you're training, say, for example, there was a time when I was um, tasked to train the correctional services team for them to participate in a championship in South Africa. Yes. Uh, I think that was early 2016 or early 2016. And I was given this team of, uh, I think, 28 officers, and we had to camp with them uh, in Naivasha Kedong yes. for some period of time until they get to the maxman level. Because yes. the cutoff line yes. was maxman. Yes, yes. And uh, I think only four out of these 23 were maxmen then. The other ah, ones okay, were novice. Okay. Yes, so I was yes. tasked to push them to a level where they would qualify as maxmen for them to, to represent the country in South Africa. Yes. And we had one of the ladies there who was the first black lady ever to participate in an African championship. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud of her. Yes. She's a chief inspector today, Elizabeth yes. Wachanga. And I always tell her, congratulations ah, for what she did. She participated eyes. very well. She passed the maximumship level yes. at Kedong. And uh, the whole team, the whole team traveled to South Africa. I didn't even have one person who did not make it they to all get, they to... all made the cut and traveled to South Africa, participated very well. One of them became, won the level of law enforcement. Um, he's now retired, but yes. he's known as Daniel Kialo. His yes. codename is Ninja. Uh -huh. And uh, others, Masha and who and who, they did some good work out of that. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, out of that, I developed the understanding that we can give more to our teams. I've also worked very closely with the anti-stock theft team, where yes. they also have a shooting team, and I managed to train with them. I've worked very closely with the anti-terror police unit, the yes. ATPU team, yes. the ERT yes. team, which we've been able to work out, and they became the best, um, the best uh, special team in Kenya. They won the Warriors Challenge mm -hmm. in 2023, I believe. Mm -hmm. And until to date, um, there's no team that has beat them because, okay, they've not have any other competition of that sort. Okay. Uh, we've had, uh, you, there's a rec team that is, uh, was to travel the other day to Dubai for them to go and participate in this event. Yes. And we were able to coordinate in some areas where we were working together with them for them to see how the, the students would work. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you today that the teams in Kenya are doing marvelously well. Okay. And we have been able to see how the input is coming from, as I told you earlier on, from the development partners. And if these are the people who are in charge of yes. our institutions, I would tell you, you should not even be scared now and say that mm -hmm. when these people are called, they respond in 17 minutes, they respond in 20 minutes, they respond in 30 minutes. There are several inter-agency drills which are done to yes. ensure that these people are on top of their game. Okay. And today, they're on top of their game. Good vibes. But then, uh, on the flip side, very good work you're doing. Shout out to you and the team that trains them. Uh, in the event that you've trained someone to, is your expert, uh, marksman, Nini, we call that, in our layman, allow me to call that James Bond. And then someone goes wrong. Like, some, you've trained someone, you know their capacity. Uh, are there measures to deal with cases such as such? Uh, I, I don't want to speak about that because I've never seen a scenario like that. And I've never, been, I've never come across a scenario where um, one of my students or people who we've trained or worked close with has gone rogue. I have never seen that because, of course, um, there's a lot of mental issues which are going on and in the country. The economy, yes. Yeah, there's a lot of issues which are going around. And I believe the discipline that is instilled in special operators yes. is of another very different level. These are, are people so who they can't be caught. They are, no, these are people who no, these are people who are they control themselves. Really. <laughs> they know they know how to deal with uh, this easy. She does it. They understand. Yeah, they yeah, yes. they can handle pressure. They can handle a lot of pressure and they can handle these pressures under all environments. Because these are people who, when sent out on duty, they'll walk into a certain place and they'll live there. Ah, they will happy. live there until they come out to that bad guy. So these are not people who are sent in to go in and then you come back and say, I okay. sent in a team yes. and uh, 
it's 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 lunch time. Yes. They need to they need to come out and go for lunch then they'll go back but akuna hiyo. They know how would you break for lunch? No. <laughs> when you <going>, to... <laughs> no, 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 no. When they go in for a mission they enter inside there uh-huh. they will come out with the results. That oh. is the kind of endurance that we are talking about. They'll push on and on and on and on and on until they ensure that Kingori, me and others will sleep in peace. Ah, hey, that's 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 Yeah, so that is how it is. I also sorry. want to mention to Happy you something. To be a, be a when uh, when you're looking at um, past scenarios. Yes. Westgate. Um do it. Where were you when Westgate happened? I was around. Around Westgate. I was around, I was not around Westgate, but I was around. In the, I was in the country, but I was not in I the was, country. Yeah, I was not I was not in 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 I was not in west yet. And you you you, ha- you have something loading but before you tell us with your level of training when you hear something like that happen what's your first response? My first responder is a first responder. Remember I'm 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 tasked as a first responder. And as a first responder I will respond to the area using the protocols which have been provided and I will make sure I help in all ways possible. And this is another thing that I'd like to to bring out to Kenyans to understand. When there is an incident which has happened somewhere remember there's a difference between an incident and a disaster yes when there is an incident that has happened somewhere kenyans should really find a way of refraining from moving to the location of the incident if there is nothing valuable you are going to they are going there. to do there because one they make it next to impossible for the teams that have responded to execute their duties Yes, they make it, this is for everybody including this is for everybody. guys with YouTube channels. This is very very important. Guys should not do that. Guys should not do that because you're running out there to go and take your clips to share them on on on, on social media. Mm-hmm. One is you could be blocking the entryway mm-hmm. where the teams would be using as an easy entry mm-hmm. because to you that is the easiest way to the location isn't it so, that so you've parked your car on the open. side mm. and because you don't get proper parking you will even park in the pavement you'll park it in the middle emergency mm. vehicles cannot exit neither can they access the location because mm. you're not there you've locked your car and everybody has run off okay so how do we get breakdowns to come and pull off your cars so yeah. that you can able to access the place and go and do the right job okay. secondly you've reached the ignore the disaster rate yes if it is a gas explosion like for god forbid and um I would like to say Paul for what has just happened the other day in the mm-hmm. country. Yeah. Um you'd find that the perimeter that you're supposed to stay away from. If you look at the international standards, such a threat requires 1600 meters cordon perimeter. That is how far you're supposed to be away from that location. Some of those tanks that were exploding were going as far as 300 meters. And you want to come there and take videos because the first reports that you were seeing on social media were all these videos and all these videos mm. and some people were not even half dressed because they're running to take that video and that is what is so important to them but how much risk are you putting yourself in you yourself what is your safety when you're running there okay. so when you have a deceit attack or when you have a waste gear attack and then maybe you've seen that one or two people were seen on the scene coming out to rescuing people Now you also want to go there so that you're caught on camera doing this mm. rescuing of people and yes, doing yes, yes. what and then when the camera is there you you're busy holding this guy but your face is more on there your face yes, is yes, more on the camera yes, yes. you see you're not helping the person you're removing from that scene to a safer location yes. is someone who's totally traumatized somebody who's coming from a place where their life was in danger mm-hmm. and you are doing it for for fun why can't you help control the crowd stop the people from coming in so that the emergency teams can do whatever they have to do okay why do you have to come into the location and say you're bringing food and the food that you're bringing is an excuse for you to get there park your vehicle then you can now start going inside to do the a b c d we have people who do that the people who could who used to do a lot of that and i'll tell you um i think the first case we had in kenya was the 1998 bomb attack that was the US embassy which is 98 one was yeah, it yeah 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 that 98. was the first incident August, we yes. had in yes. august then the second was that the one first was incident? that was the first one then the second one i think was the west gate there was a bus bombing um which um, sources say was targeted at a politician sometime back 
uh, mm. but that's mm. I'm talking about mass something which is more ah, or less mass and it was yes. in a public place and which really affected a good number of people yes. I was present during that period and I stayed on the site I think for four or five days when you we are helping people with uh, four five with days four to five days I remember then the PC was Kaguti I think it was called Kaguti mm. and he was there and uh, he came along and we really worked very close you're still in security uh, I was an active member of the Kenya Red Cross and I'm a life member of the Kenya Red Cross. So uh-huh. I was there on site and uh, we, we really did some, some work trying to, to, to help and assist one or two, three places. And I will tell you that that culture has changed a lot. But today you'd find people are crowding to incidence areas more mm-hmm. than those days. Right? Okay. People are running towards a problem. People don't want to run away from their problem. Okay. And I would like that please to come out very clearly. People should stop doing that because they inhibit a lot of teams like when the special teams come or when the multi agencies send in the special teams these people know why they are coming in and immediately you start going on YouTube mm-hmm. and you're showing this special team is moving in and the bad guys are on YouTube and they're seeing all movements then they are seeing oh left wing there's a team approaching right wing there's a team approaching center there's a team approaching but you're cool on your YouTube you're getting likes and you're getting what and you're getting what the 300 people inside the building you're still endangering their lives. Yeah, endangering their lives. So I don't want to say YouTubing is wrong, mm-hmm. but choose your priorities. Okay, and um, in your experience in security, what do you think is the difference between revenge and justice? Revenge before, and justice? Yes, before we talk about the cycle of violence. You mm-hmm. hit us, we hit you. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between revenge and justice? Uh, I think revenge is um, selfish, malicious, and uh, it's totally uncalled for. Okay. Justice is relevant because it is a rule of law. Okay. Yeah. So the cycle of violence, I believe this is something you've interacted with. Uh, a friend of mine from high school uh, I respect, Sana, I think he's one of the people who fights for country. Uh, he told me the cycle of violence never stops. You hit us, we hit you. Do, what do you think of that concept? Do you think it's possible uh, to exist in peace without violence? So when you say you hit us, we hit you, who are we hitting? Uh, let's say, for example, in the, in the, in the context of counter-terrorism. Mm-hmm. Uh, a country gets attacked, it's attacks back, it attacks back. Uh, it's at- it attacks back. The country that has been attacked regroups, and then you have to pre- prepare yourself because you know they are coming. There is no, no place where... Um, uh, for in the context of Kenya, which I would like to speak about, because when I, what, what I see happening in the U.S. and what I see happening in these other countries, in Israel, in what is happening with the Hamas and with who else, to me, I wouldn't want to get myself involved in it, because most of the information that we are getting, and me I'm getting, is from the social media. Yes. And I don't want to believe everything that I get from the social media. You know, so I don't want to speak on it as if I, I would know what to say about it. Uh-huh. But I want to bring you back to what is currently happening in Kenya. Why is Kenya in Somalia? Because when we felt that Somalia had become a threat to the country, what did we do? We did not go to attack Somali. Mm-hmm. We looked for a way and a reason to bring stability within Somali so that we don't get attacks from that country. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. When we find that there's an issue coming from that side, what did we do? We closed our borders. Because we know that there is a problem coming from that side. So on the concept of the cycle of saying that you attack us, we attack you, I don't see Kenya going in that direction. Because when we are hit from the Sudanese area, we don't go fight the Sudanese government. Mm -hmm. We find where is a problem coming in from that area of the Sudanese area. And you reinforce, you see our Kenyan troops moving towards that direction Mm -hmm. and they make sure they stabilize the area. They don't go to fight back and throw bombs on that other side so that those guys can also feel you came and chopped our two cows. So even us can come with chopper your 20 cows. You see, uh, I think yeah, there yeah. is a difference on how we are handling our matters as a country. And, uh, and if that is what is happening in this country, then I think I don't know Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely put. Okay, when I, when I hear what we Kisema at the uh, Kenya police are not ready for Haiti, I told you about a magazine I saw at the DCI, and mm-hmm. I'm like, uh, I hope that members of the public can get access to that. Mm-hmm. Right? But then again, people in Haiti want to say, the situation there is different. From your assessment, do you think my boys were Kenya were already to kurdisha Haiti kwe ame control, especially kama critics wana sema mtawezana na Haiti na bado kariyobangi kwa apa? 
Mm-hmm. The mission that you're going to do in Haiti also mm-hmm. determines on which kind of people are being taken to Haiti. Yes. If the mission you're going to do in Haiti requires a specialized team, then I believe the people who would be going to Haiti are specialized boys. Yes. yes. If the mission of what you're going to do is maybe uh, securing uh, critical infrastructures and things like that, yes. then the people who are going to be going to Haiti will be trained for that. Mm-hmm. It is next to impossible for me to even imagine and think that we would be sending Kenyan officers to go to Haiti if they're not prepared and you don't know what kind of life they're going to do in Haiti. Remember, Kenya boasts to have one of the best intelligence units yes, yes. in Africa and all over the world. Uh, uh, so uh. we cannot just be taking people before we have the right information yes. and you know why these people are going okay. to Haiti. If such opportunities are given to our, our, our officers and they're able to go to Haiti and display or be able to, to participate in, in, in worldwide uh, unified programs like this, mm. I think it is a good opportunity for them to be allowed to, to travel and also to be able to secure such infrastructures. Imagine the wealth of, um, of, of, of knowledge and information that they would also come back with. Because when you go for international missions, you definitely come back with a lot of experience which is shared back home. And this is how we also stop a lot of inbreeding and we get to know how to bring in new tactics and techniques. Okay. Not saying that we are going to go and find those things in Haiti, but the teams that are to go to Haiti We'll be going there to execute and do some good job. Okay. And I believe they are, they are be... able and capable of doing that duty that is set out for them out there. Of course, of course, there are a lot of measures that have to be put in place, and I'm seeing the government working on that because these teams must be well equipped when they're going out there. They must be trained well, mm-hmm. and which I've seen it already happening, mm-hmm. and they must be able to get the right information to be put in the right locations. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to be dropped in the streets of Haiti. Mm-hmm. And then they are told to put on a belly. Okay. No, no, no. These are oh. people who are already, this is already set up. It's a government system. So, yes. I'll ask you this again. You have your gun shop, triple tap. Yes. Uh, you are in the business to make a profit. Yes. Right? Uh, don't you feel bad that uh, unafungua duka now you have people who have money, like in your Zingia Kodukako now and Like you, when a friend visits you, for example, na ukona i unana ukona glock apo lakini akona do but always in Muzia. Doesn't it make you feel bad? No, it doesn't. You're okay with the few people you sell to? Yes, because you see, um, when you're in the business of selling gold, when you're in the business of selling silver, you sell it to the people who have value for the gold and who have value for the silver. Yeah. And um, somebody who doesn't even understand what gold is, and they could be care. having a lot of money, and they're your friends, and they'll they be coming there, they'll be seeing the gold. But you've, you know that even if you try and sell it to him and convince him, it mm-hmm. will not work. But this is a very, these are controlled substances. So talking yes. about controlled firearms, you, you, your friends are there. You don't want to have all your friends owning firearms and they don't like it, so that you can be able to make some money. Yeah. Because you see now that's when you're becoming a con man. You're conning them into mm. supporting your business and they don't, they have no use for it. They have no need for it. You only do trained customers. You have to, no, you have to work with the customers that we are provided for. And trust me, it is customers are there. Do you have the option of training customers? Like, for example, uh, triple tap. Are you allowed to advertise? Are you allowed to talk about your shop? Yes, why Are should you... I not? Yes, triple tap range limited. We are based on uh, Lenana Road, Kedong House, third floor. We do our operations in many range shooting ranges at JCK, at uh, Kirigiti Shooting Club. We also at uh, Kedong Ranch, where we have a very good training facility, supported very well by the anti-terrorism uh, program of the US Embassy. And we have a marvelous range there, well supported by the management of Kedong, the directors there are really supporting the Kenyan government by making sure that their training facility that is there serves okay. this nation. Okay, so based on interest, you can take a pool of people, train them how to shoot? If they're they licensed, of course, yes. Okay. If they're licensed firearm holders, yes. Today I had a course that we were running for all, um, all 90% of the shooting ranges, and we were looking at the range administrators, the officers who are taking care of shooting ranges. We were training them on, on situation awareness. We are training them on health matters. We are mm-hmm. training them on basic firearm handling skills so mm-hmm. that they are well equipped. When their clients are coming then, they know what to do. And if you're not licensed and you want to train and learn how to use a firearm, the mm-hmm. constitution is very clear. It can only be for sporting purposes when accompanied by a licensed firearm 
holder. It cannot be just um, anyone who just wakes up and comes and says, this is what I want to do and I want to go to the shooting range and I want to shoot and I'm learning because I want to know if you use this firearm because tomorrow I have got somebody who I don't like because of this, then you'll also be encouraging some security lapses, which is not allowed. Okay, does, does the job, does, does your, your business come with guilt? With, with guilt? Uh, if you, if you if, uh, guilt in the sense of uh, if you hear your customer has used the product you sold them, do you feel uh, guilty in, in the event that it has a fatality? Like, can, can you be, and this is a general question, mm -hmm. uh, can you be a, can, uh, does it have a Christian world balance as a good Christian? Mm. Like, I think loss of life is loss of life. You see, the giver of life is God. And uh, when, when there is loss of life, then of course you, you, you feel part of it because if this is your client and it okay. is a farm that was bought from you, yes. then for you to go outside and have a drink and celebrate and say, oh yeah, one of my farms has done this and this, then I think you must be a dog or mentor. And oh, that so is not good. Your joy as a businessman is when your clients don't use the things you sell them. My joy as a, as a, as a, as a firearms um, dealer is to see that the kind of firearms that we do sell serve our clients to the best. Okay. Yeah, it should serve them to the best. If it's going to protect their lives and yes. the lives of their loved ones, yes. and if it's going to make them be safe, then I think I'll be able to sleep as a happy man. Are you allowed to export? Like if from the rumors, uh, there's a place like Congo, which probably there's a very ripe market that they don't need uh, licenses. Are you allowed to export in areas like Congo? Um, we do apply through the Farm Licensing Board. If you have any contract, they scrutinize it, they will look at it. And if they see that you do pass those credentials of you need to export the farms, then they will allow you. Also remember the farms that we do have, have something called an end user certificate. It's an EUC, which you get if I'm importing firearms, say Glocks from Austria. Yes. Then there's an EUC, which means that I cannot re-export it. Okay. It can only be used in Kenya, so they can have traceability on it. Okay. If it is firearms which have been produced in Kenya, because yes. you know there's an industry that produces firearms in Kenya, if that, if that industry produces firearms, and if I find that I can be allowed to export them, through that particular industry, I will follow the laid down protocols and make sure that I get the right permits and will definitely export. So I can get an import, export, license and permit from the Farm Licensing Board and I must meet all the regulations that have been laid down. Why would someone come to buy a gun from you when they can go to the government factory in Ruiro? Oh, it depends if the firearm that is in Ruiro is what they're looking for. This is a reverse question of, did the government's uh, decision to open a gun factory in Riru affect your business in terms of competition? No, not in any way. Because the market that they're targeting and the market that we are targeting are two different markets. Okay. Yes. So as a gun, as a gun shop, um, shop owner, right, uh, you have imported 1,000 guns. Are you allowed to work, you have a license for all of them? To work with anyone you want. Ama, you have to apply to walk out of your shop with your guns that you bought with your money. <laughs> your license to carry the firearm that is on you and that you possess. But the, the license, shop is the mine. firearm is my, the shop is mine, yes. But the firearms that are inside the shop are not for mine, are not for me to carry. They're for me to sell under certain regulations. They're for me to store under certain regulations. But, but they, they are, are not mine to carry and. Uh, and to go around and, 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 and even use them for my self-defense. You can. No, no, no. You can no, you say cannot. you are delivering to a customer. No, you cannot. And then something happens. Then when something happens, I have my firearm, which I'm supposed to use. The uh -huh. other ones will be locked in a storage container and they will move from position A to position B under the current security protocols because they must be escorted by the police when I'm moving them from one location to another location. You must be escorted by police yes. for moving your stock. Yes, because my stock is not regular stock. It is firearms and it is ammunition. But as a, as a master shooter, mm -hmm. uh, you, you only need your driver and you sit with your stock. Who would have the courage? To come and attack you? Yes. You say that even the best, even the best, even the best will be taken down by one small bladder. Okay. Even the best. Okay. So you cannot be the one who consumes your own stuff. Okay. That will not work. They say you don't get high on your shit. Okay. <laughs> Before we let you go, yeah. is there an acceptable level of crime? Say, for example, mm -hmm. I know 
I have seen a glimpse of what the Kenya security system is capable of. Mm-hmm. I'm like, as in, from where I sit, you can correct me. From where I sit, like there is units that DCI uh, Nini, uh, will send to certain areas, so-called hotspots, crime would melt 100%. Uh, are the units trained for just in case something very bad happened is when we will send them. Uh, they will respond. Like, is there an, are the crime levels in the country at acceptable or could they be reduced to zero? Crime levels should be reduced to zero. I don't believe there's any positive crime in this country that makes us grow or develop. A crime is a crime. A crime is a crime. But if you're asking me if there are units which have been set aside just to go and handle one particular crime or another particular crime, I'll say that they're specialists who are specialized to deal with anti-terrorist kind of criminal uh, activities. Those ones? Those are people who are anti-terrorist specialists. And they are trained beyond the normal kind of person because the kind of extremities that they deal with are not common. They're not dealing with a common person. Because remember, somebody who is uh, planning to come and terrorize you is somebody who has surveyed you, is somebody who has done his homework, is somebody who knows. He has even maybe th- he's, he's even thought about your response time. He knows that this is what is going to happen before mm-hmm. this happens to here. Mm-hmm. And today, when they're planning to do that and they're training themselves to do that, we are training 10 times, 10 times more to make sure that that bullshit doesn't happen. And I don't fear calling it bullshit because it is bullshit. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. Asante sana yeah. for making time for us. Asante sana for the good vibes. No problem. You're Asante so much. Sana. You're so much welcome. Asante. Mazia Asante sana for sticking with us up to this point. We hope that you enjoyed our content. Stay subscribed for more good vibes coming your way. I'm Dr. Kingore. See you on the next one.